Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential orchestral versions of piano originals for beginners, because this is something that beginners are going to encounter quite frequently. If you're just starting out, you may have noticed that many popular works exist in more than one version. A lot of them may have been composed for another instrument and then arranged for a different ensemble or medium. And one of the most popular is to write a piano piece and then make an orchestral version of it. Sometimes those versions are made by the composer. Sometimes they're made by other people, either at the behest of the composer or after the death of the composer. And sometimes those other arrangements become vastly more popular than the piano originals. And we can be quite surprised to discover that there actually was an original version that's not the one we're used to. But this is all very normal. And one of the marvelous things about these types of situations is that you get to hear two different versions of the same work. And they're going to sound very different quite often. Yes, the music is the same, but there's a world of difference between a piano version, which has a basic equality between the two hands, and thus an equality of harmony and texture. I mean, yeah, you can play one hand softer than the other, for example. You could emphasize the melody. But essentially, and especially when things start heating up, you know, what you hear is equality of voices, um, and at least the same timbre for all the voices. Whereas in an orchestral version of something, it, nothing balances other than by the actual dictation of the person who does the arrangement. You know, because certain instruments are stronger than other instruments, you've got 50 or 60 strings and one or two of everything else. And so the art of orchestration in, in these cases often consists of rebalancing the entire work, finding what parts you want to emphasize, what parts should be subsidiary, and how you arrange them, and pieces that could sound quite busy and contrapuntal, that is having several parts going on at once, in an orchestral version can sound simply like a tune and an accompaniment. It can, or it can go the other way too. So it's really very interesting to listen to both the orchestral and original versions, and it's a very good exercise in 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 critical listening, if you're if you're a beginner, to hear you know how a piece can sound different ways while still remaining you know itself. I think that there are very very good exercises in training your ears um, for what to hear and what matters to you as a listener. What parts, what melodies, what what patterns, what harmonies really means something to you in one version versus another version. So here's the list of 10. And these are these are marvelous pieces that you'll really enjoy if you don't. Some of them you may already know. The first is by Ravel. It's called Alborada del Gracioso, which means the the morning song of a jester, a court jester. And it's a charming piece of of Spanishism which Ravel did a lot of. Most French composers love to write things influenced or inspired by Spain, so you hear clicking little castanets. Boom. It's wonderful. But the bottom line is that it was originally part of a piano suite called Miroir, Mirrors. And one of these mirrors is Alborada del Gracioso, and Ravel orchestrated it. And he did it, he, he, Ravel was such a great orchestrator that the stuff that is, you would never know, let's put it this way, that his orchestral music came from a piano original. But virtually everything he wrote for orchestra came from a piano original. It's really extraordinary. But, you know, the mark of a, of a genius is that they, he doesn't just orchestrate the piano piece. He reimagines it as if the piano original had never existed. And so it sounds like a fully fledged orchestral piece. It's delightful. So give that a shot to start out. Next, something that Ravel was actually kind of almost concerned with. This is Albaniz, Isaac Albaniz, his Iberia. Now, Iberia is this big, long, glorious, glorious sequence of tone poems for piano. There are a dozen, about a dozen of them in several books, each representing a different region of Spain. And it, it's one of the great masterpieces of the piano literature. It was written around the turn of the 20th century. And, and it was so ripe 
for orchestration that Ravel wanted to do it. But when he wanted to do it, he was told that, no, the rights had been given to the Spanish composer Enrique Arbos. And Ravel's reaction supposedly was, who the hell is Enrique Arbos? Because no one had heard of him. But Arbos, in the, in the event, did a very creditable job of taking just a few of those original, original ones, five of them or so, and arranging them for orchestra. And they're beautiful and marvelous, and you should really know all of Iberia, but, you know, just take the five that Arbos orchestrated. They've been recorded many, many times. But after Arbos did it, another Spanish composer named Carlos Surinach also completed Iberia. So now you can get the whole thing if you want it. And other people have orchestrated it too. Leopold Stokowski did certain bits of it. You know, people have taken a crack at Iberia for a long, long time because it seems to scream out for the additional color that an orchestration would bring. So you can either listen to Arbos or you can listen to Arbos and Surinach or you could listen to somebody else doing other bits of it and it's all fun and it's just beautiful, beautiful music, a wonderful work. After that, Aaron Copland, his orchestral variations. Now, Copland arranged his orchestral variations from an earlier work called Piano Variations. Get it? It's the same thing. See, the piano variations were early Copland, and we all know Aaron Copland from works like Billy the Kid or Rodeo. You know Rodeo? It's the beef commercial. You know, beef, real food for real people or whatever it was. Or Appalachian Spring. Really popular pieces. And deliberately so, they were populist works based on American folk tunes and whatnot. But his earlier music was far more experimental and avant-garde and harmonically spiky. I love it. Oh, I love it. It's so refreshing and brilliant and rhythmically tricky. And so for that reason, the piano variations, which are exceptionally difficult to play and not terribly long, it's like 10 minutes or so, not long, um, never got played. So he made it into an orchestral piece. And one of the ironies of 20th century life um, is that, as a composer, is that it's easier to get performances of orchestral music than it often is of solo music. And that's because there are just so many fabulous orchestras looking for good repertoire to do. There are a lot of fabulous soloists too, but they're not going to get attention in a solo recital doing Copland's orchestral variations, which are spiky and somewhat difficult, as opposed to, for example, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. So what do you think they're going to pick? On the other hand, in the context of a big orchestral concert where you're doing a Brahms symphony and <laughs> Beethoven overture, oh, why not? You can do Copland's orchestral variations, and you're much more likely to find people willing to do it as often as not. Anyway, that's what's happened quite a bit in the 20th century. It's funny, you know, in the 19th century, composers reduced orchestral pieces because without recordings or broadcasting or radio, no one could hear them unless there was a big orchestra and they went to see it. And how many opportunities would anyone have to do that? So people made piano arrangements, small force arrangements to be played at home where music making took place. But now it's just the opposite. Pieces written for smaller forces are getting blown up and inflated to show off the virtuosity of today's absolutely amazing orchestras, which are everywhere. So there you go, Copland's Orchestral Variations, a phenomenon and at once an iconic example of a modern trend. After Copland, Liszt, Hungarian Rhapsody number no. two, you know that one. You know, that's that one. And the opening is da da bottom. Yeah, da 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 bottom. It was the Tom and Jerry cartoon. It was a Bugs Buddy cartoon. And in those cartoons, incidentally, they use they use a mixture of piano and orchestral versions of it, which is kind of interesting. Liszt and some assistants made a version of the piece for orchestra. It also exists for piano. It's wonderful both ways. Um, you already know the tunes, probably. And so uh, I don't need to say anything other than to say that it exists in both of these versions, and you should try and hear them. They're interesting, and they differ in some ways, actually, um, depending on who the arranger was and what they did with it. So there's that. 
And then, oh yeah, this is fun. Schubert's Grand Duo in C major. The Grand Duo is a piece for piano four hands. And, and Schubert wrote amazing music for, you know, one piano with two people sitting there with four hands eventually. And this piece has very controversial because it's a big four movement symphony for piano four hands. Now, there's a big question whether Schubert intended it to remain a piece for piano four hands or whether it should have been orchestrated and simply wasn't because it's a complete, it's a symphony, it's a completely symphonic work in all of its details. People who lament the fact that Schubert, you know, left his unfinished symphony and didn't write more and lots of other pieces of symphonies that he never finished. Um, there is this work. And so it's only natural that it should have been orchestrated by various people, mostly, most notably, Josef Joachim, who was the great violinist in the 19th century, who sort of rediscovered Beethoven's violin concerto, and Brahms wrote his violin concerto for him, and Bruch wrote his violin concerto for him, but he was also a composer, and not a bad one, not a bad one at all. And he arranged Schubert's grand duo for orchestra quite, quite well. There's also another arrangement by the conductor Felix Weingartner, and who knows who else may have done it. But this is a real sleeper of a piece. If you love Schubert and if you have heard some of his symphonies and you may hear it discussed, listen to the grand duo in the symphonic version and in its piano version. Very, very interesting. Very interesting indeed and beautiful, rewarding music. So after that, oh, of course, this is not exactly a piano work, but it's something that everyone needs to know. It's the Bach Stokowski Toccata and Fugue in D minor, famously leading off the movie Fantasia. Da da da, yeah, da 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 dum bum, you know, the Phantom of the Opera thing. Yeah, it's an organ work. It's an organ work that. Leopold Stokowski orchestrated as a virtuoso orchestral showpiece. And again, it's so well known, and in both of its versions, frankly, that I, I, I hardly need mention it. But it's something that I just want to point out because the orchestration is such a colorful showpiece for each section of the orchestra, whereas the organ original is a showpiece for each rank or pipe or voice or all the colors of the organ as well. It's marvelous, absolutely marvelous. So after that, let's see. Oh yeah, here's something that's a little unusual. Rachmaninoff orchestrated by Ottorino Respighi. Now Respighi wrote The Pines of Rome, which is very, very well known, and other brilliantly colored orchestral works. He was a master orchestrator. And, and the piece in question here are some of uh, Rachmaninoff's piano pieces, his five etude tableau, they're called. An etude tableau is an etude, something that's supposed to be a study piece. It uses some, some you know, extreme form of, of technical training for the pianist, but also tableau, meaning it's a picture of something. It has a programmatic significance as well. And Respighi took this, this group of them and orchestrated them. They were very, very unknown until maybe, oh gosh, I guess about maybe 20 or 30 years ago, they started to pop up. People realized that these things existed and everybody wanted to hear them. And they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful arrangements. One's called the sea and the gulls. They're just lovely, lovely pieces, fabulously arranged. And, uh, you know, they're kind of a stereo showpiece. You know, they, they, there's a wonderful recording of them on reference recordings, for example, you know, for people who are really into great hi-fi sound with other blockbuster sonic pieces with them. So Rachmaninoff's Etude Tableau, orchestrated by Respighi, are wonderful. The originals are beautiful, too. So you can give those a shot. After that, let me see who else we have here. Up oh, three more. Dvorak, The Legends. Oh, these are so beautiful. Dvorak's Legend is was like... The Schubert Grand Duo, duo originally written for four-hand piano. It's a piano original, which he orchestrated slightly after composing it for piano original. The legends are 10 short works. We have no idea what legend Dvorak is talking about. He does not tell us. He, he's very, very nice about it. He just says, well, they're just legends. They're legendary. And so uh, we don't know. All we know is that the music is beautiful. Lyrical, wonderful. They run about like six, seven minutes each, five to seven minutes, somewhere in there. It's about an hour 
all told, in playing time. Extraordinary works that are virtually unknown because they just are. I mean, nobody knows what to do with them. They're written for a chamber-sized orchestra, not a big orchestra. Um, they're mostly lyrical. They're incredibly well uh, you know, sorted so that you, know, you can listen to the whole set. It's not a problem. Um, the tunes are unbelievable, but people don't know them. So you can make up the difference. Listen to the orchestral version, and if you feel like it, listen to the piano version. It's oodles of fun. After Dvorak, Brahms. Yes, the variations on a theme by Haydn. Now, the theme by Haydn isn't actually by Haydn. It's by nobody knows who it's by. It's called the St. Anthony Chorale. You may have heard it. It goes, ya da dum bum ba da 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 ya da 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 like that. Um, it's really, really beautiful, and Brahms wrote this set of variations on that particular tune. And he originally, like Dvorak and like Schubert and all those people, he originally wrote it for piano, for hands, and then he orchestrated it quite beautifully. Now, one of the things about these piano forehand arrangements you may have noticed is that they tend to be rather uh, orchestral by nature because four people playing one keyboard makes a lot of harmony. It can be a very dense and big sound. And so, and so if you're you know, going to have all that stuff happening all at once on one keyboard, you might as well arrange it for orchestra, which has a tendency to declog the textures. Um, especially the big moments where you just have so much happening on that one keyboard that the sound can become very, very dense, even denser than what it sounds like in the orchestra. It's a very interesting question in musical aesthetics, how you actually hear it. And it's, that's why it's so much fun to listen to both versions. And this is one of those pieces where that's particularly true. It's wonderful to hear both versions because Brahms was a master at writing for piano and piano four hands is, you know, was his meat and potatoes. And, and he was also a great composer for the orchestra. His orchestration is a little bit more controversial. Some people don't think it's very good. It's extremely good in this work. It's beautiful, and it's a beautiful contrast to the original. However, last but not least, here's a work everybody knows or ought to know or should know or will get to know. Um, it's Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition arranged by Ravel. Here's Ravel again, the great orchestrator. Now, Ravel's version of Pictures in an Exhibition is so famous and so well-known that most people forget that Mussorgsky wrote the original piece as a piano piece, and Ravel didn't orchestrate 100% of it. There are a couple bits that are, that are different in the Ravel version than in the Mussorgsky original, so it's fun to listen to the original. But beyond that, Beyond that, the, the orchestral version is so effective and so successful that um, it almost obliterated the piano version. Um, so we, had, we need to make amends and revive the piano version and give it a listen. It's such a glorious orchestral work, though. It's really kind of hard to go back to the original. Some people have complained that Ravel's version is so sophisticated and beautiful and sensitive and that it doesn't sound particularly Russian. I don't know what that means. I mean, Mussorgsky was an amateur orchestrator, and his own orchestrations are really kind of rough and not terribly, terribly good quite often. Um, and he never orchestrated it anyway. So to go and make it sound like clumsy Mussorgsky orchestration wannabe is probably not a terribly good idea. Many other people have orchestrated the work, however. Again, Leopold Stokowski made his own version. Um, Vladimir Ashkenazi made his own version. The conductor, Leonard Slacken, recorded a wonderful composite version with like all the different bits that each one orchestrated by somebody else. It's that popular a piece as a subject for orchestration because each picture cries out for orchestral treatment. And uh, it's, just, it's just an amazing piece and a wonderful sort of moment in music history because you can spend the rest of your life listening to different orchestrations or versions of pictures in an exhibition and comparing them to the piano original. But it's definitely an exercise worth doing in some fashion, in whatever way, you know, you feel inclined to do. If you just like Ravel's version, stick with it. You're fine. But if you're curious 
listen to the piano original and get to know it. Because, you know, the, the point of, of doing these comparisons is that you really get to know the music. And the more you listen to it and the better you know it, the more affecting and beautiful and, and emotionally deep and marvelous it's going to sound. It's all a question of time spent and knowledge gained and emotional payoff because that's what you get. The emotional payoff. It makes it all worthwhile. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Enjoy these orchestral transcriptions of piano originals. They're a lot of fun. They really, really are. Take care. <laughs>